Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me at the back? The microphone is working? Yeah. Okay. So actually the reason why I took the perturbation out is because it's not in the booklet, right? So I had it in the title of uh, a previous lecture. So yeah, this should be many body perturbation theory and GW. So this mysterious acronym GW, you've probably heard a few times now during the workshop. <clears throat> so now is the time to learn what's behind it. And I realized there was a talk, I think last Wednesday or Thursday by uh, Thomas Kurtzdorfer, who actually benchmarked a lot with this method, right? So the talks in, in a way were in the wrong order, <coughs> but uh, I understand he's on vacation now and they probably didn't want to bring him back from vacation to give the talk right after mine. So uh, <clears throat> I guess you had to believe him at the time that this GW was something useful and uh, today I'll fill this with life and, and try and convince you that indeed it is something useful. <clears throat> so what uh, I'll do in this lecture today is to um, sort of give you the basic principles of spectroscopy. So you've done a lot of ground state work. Now we're perturbing the ground state and we're moving to excited states. Then I'll introduce this object that is the Green's function and the closely related self-energy. And much like the electron density, these are the objects that we are then working with in that theory. Um, and then, because we're good scientists, we will make an approximation, and that approximation will make it and uh, make the theory tractable, and that's then also what's implemented in FHI Ames. Um, and then, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about why we're not actually doing this with density functional theory. Right? You can do it. You can do a little bit, but then there's a reason why uh, a different theory is developed and needs to be used. So <clears throat> let's start with the uh, spectroscopy. Um, so this is mostly an experimental term, right? So you have a spectrometer, you have a, a method that um, perturbs the system and then you record spectra. And here's a typical example of a photo emission spectrum, angle resolved photo emission, RPES where uh, you have many different lines. Each one is a spectrum and then you vary the incident angle of the light and then you get spectra at different angles and then you can try and extract a band structure from that. Right. But what you have to ask yourself always when you do an experiment is, is it actually appropriate? So was this the right experiment for the question you were asking? And is it accurate enough to determine the quantity that you want? You can see Already here, there's some broadening. So if I wanted to interpret this as a peak, then I need to ask myself, how much does the width influence the final answer? <clears throat> and this is actually then where theoretical spectroscopy can help and complement, right? So this is a term that only fairly recently came about, right? So we can try and do exactly the same as an experiment, but now in theory and in the computer, right? And again, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Is the theory, is the methodological framework that we're using actually appropriate, right? Remember the question that I posed at the beginning, why are we not doing this with DFT? Um, and then what's our accuracy, right? Are we again good enough when we compare to experiment or higher level theory? <clears throat> Because ultimately what we want to do is not worry about these issues too much. We want to do material science, we want to do physics and chemistry, we want to do applications and, and calculate properties and discover uh, new phenomena and mechanisms. <clears throat> so I like to go, there are many forms of spectroscopy of course and many related theories. Today I like to pick the example of a photo emission and briefly touch on, on optical absorption and then uh, introduce to you Green's function theory and these two approximations, GW and, and beta cell beta. Um, <clears throat> I like to illustrate this with a, a few examples um, and they come from the field of the, the nitrites uh, on the left here. And those are light emitting diodes for instance uh, here that are now revolutionizing our solid state lighting uh, or lasers. Um, you can also use it for, for photovoltaics, of course. And then on the organic side, you have the counterpart, if you wish, in organic electronics. And you can also make light emitting devices or light absorbing devices 
like uh, these displays here. <coughs> um, so why are these systems still interesting? Um, so in solid state lighting, although we now have uh, these LEDs, there are still fundamental mechanisms that impede the efficiency, the conversion efficiency of electricity into light. And this has all to do with brightness. And then there, there are a lot of issues with color variability, color stability, color mixing, for instance. And then there's still a big problem with uh, the laser diodes. So one of the visions, as you can see, that is quite old actually, is to have a, a laser diode that is uh, powerful enough to, to project, right? And then you can, if you have such a, a laser system in your cell phone, you can just use your cell phone as a projector. You wouldn't need such a, a chunky thing that we currently have uh, up there, right? Um, and this would then work with color matching or color mixing, red, green, and blue. And uh, red and blue are available, but uh, green is not. And this is a material science problem. Um, <clears throat> so the problem that I brought along that I'll come back to uh, is, is this one then very simply. The nitrides were very good or are very good um, solid state system for these applications because they all these aluminum, gallium, indium nitride crystallize in the same crystal structure. And if you remember the, the talk uh, this morning and maybe the exercise you did in the last couple of days, then we can mix these material systems and create intermediaries, right, alloys, that then have um, the desired properties. So the property we're after here is the band gap. And we would like it to be in this visible region for a display or an LED or laser application. And the nice thing is that the band gaps of gallium and indium nitride straddle this optical region. So if we mix uh, appropriately, then we can go from blue to green to, to red. Now, this is true only if the band cap of indium nitride is actually down here. Now, I put a question mark there because when these materials were developed in the early 2000s, the, the band cap was actually believed to be much, much, much larger, right? Uh, two electron volts, and then this concept wouldn't have worked, or not as well. So I'll address this problem as we go along. <clears throat> and then we very much have the same uh, questions for the organic electronics. Um, so the inorganic solar cells, they're still quite expensive, so we would very much like to use organic materials, but they're very inefficient, so we're kind of trapped in this conundrum, and a lot of this has to do with level alignment and bring in charge in and out of these systems. And this is one of the questions you can address with GW, as I will show you later. <clears throat> um, yeah, as I just said. Good, so let's come to the um, fundamentals of spectroscopy. So what we are talking about here is uh, photoemission spectroscopy. The way this works is that you take your system and then you shine light on the system on your sample. Right, <clears throat> and, and due to Einstein's photo effect, that um, hits when this light hits on an electron, the electron takes that energy and goes into a higher quantum mechanical state. And if that state is high enough that it is in the in the vacuum, it can leave the sample, and then we can detect it in a, in a detector. And if you then measure the energy of this uh, electron, photoelectron, and you know the energy of the incident light, then you can do uh, write down a difference equation, and from that you can find out. Uh, how tightly that electron was bound in the sample, and that gives you information on the occupied states of the system, right? Now, you can invert the process. You can inject electrons, right? They will trickle down to available unoccupied states, and then in the process, they emit light. This light you detect. Again, you know the energy of the incoming electrons. You measure the energy of the light that comes out, and the difference tells you uh, the energy of the unoccupied states, or formerly unoccupied states. So this way, if you think of your band structure or your density of states as having a part that is related to occupied states and one to unoccupied states, here's a way now to probe this. This is somewhat different from optical absorption, which you may think works on the same principle as, as photoemission, but you're not emitting anything, right? So again, you shine in light, uh, the electron uh, is excited, but it does not leave the sample, right? So it stays in a previously unoccupied state. It kind of forms this electron hole pair here. Um, <clears throat> so the energy is seemingly lost to you, 
right? Because you've, you've done this internal excitation, but nothing comes out. So what you then measure is basically how much does not come out. And from that, you can learn something again about your system. <clears throat> but you can see, while this involves only really uh, tracking one electron, here you now need to keep track of an electron in a hole. So this is a, a different form of, of spectroscopy. That's why I put a different acronym here. So I'm not actually going to talk about this part here. I, I just put it here to, to illustrate the point and, and to avoid confusion later in the, in the tutorial. Claudia Draxel, who was supposed to have the talk following mine, uh, would have talked about this. Now she will talk about it on Friday. Right? So you will learn about it, uh, but not today. <clears throat> Good. So um, how? Let, let's look at this then uh, quantum mechanically. So we can very much follow this, this logical process. Um, so we start off with uh, our system. It has n electrons, and uh, it's in the ground state, right? So in the ground state, it will have a ground state total energy. You know how to calculate it. And it has the ground state wave function. Um, let's assume it's the, the full wave function, not the cone charms later determinant. So now we bring in the light, and then we promote the electron, right? And for this, we, uh, we assume it leaves the sample, so it's gone, right? So we call this here an annihilation operator. So we basically kill one electron out of that n, n electron ground state. So what we're then left with is a system that has one electron less, or one hole more, right? And of course, that system also has a wave function, and it also has a total energy associated with it, right? But now it has, in a sense, many wave functions and many total energies because the system is not necessarily in its n minus 1 electron ground state. It can also be an excited state uh, of, of that n minus 1 electron system. <clears throat> and this fact here I've denoted by S for state, right? Um, and this will then later give us the spectrum. Um, so then you can see here, I um, don't know if I have it here, right? So now this difference here is very clear, right? This difference here is the energy difference that we're, that we're interested in. So that is actually the removal energy, the energy that it costs to take an electron out of the system, uh, or as we later call it, the excitation energy. And then this matrix element that we now get is then the um, probability amplitude for removing this, uh, this uh, electron. And it already looks like a wave function. So later, we will call it the wave function of this process. <clears throat> and then in inverse photo emission, we go through the same steps, only with adding an electron. So we then, in the end, end up with an n plus 1 electron system, right, where we have an n plus 1 to the neutral um, energy difference and then a different matrix element, but it's of the same form. <clears throat> so, so far, this all seems very logical. Um, now comes the leap of faith, right? Um, that can be proven by many pages of algebra, which I spare you. So, it turns out, and this is the power now, that these quantities that are just introduced, these wave functions and these energies, right? They're actually in an algebraic uh, form of an object that we call the Green's function, right? I'll motivate this Green's function a bit more later. <clears throat> so we can write down a spectral representation of the Green's function. And that actually, if we have it, tells us what the exact excitation energies of the system are, and then what these transition amplitudes are. And then we can, back to, we can get back to a spectrum, as we saw it on one of the first slides, by simply tracing over this Green's function and taking the, the imaginary part. So this way, if we can calculate the Green's function, we can straight away calculate the spectral function and compare it uh, to experiment. <clears throat> so if you paid close attention, you might have seen that uh, there is <clears throat> this eta going to, to 0 here, right? So if I, if I plot this object here, what I'll get is actually a, just a delta function. Right? And this makes sense because these are electron excitations. And the electron itself is an elementary particle. It cannot decay. You cannot break it. Right? So its lifetime is always infinite. So this is somewhat contrary to our observation, 
that in this experimental spectrum, right, we, uh, we have peak broadening. Right? So if we look at here, for instance, then we can clearly identify this region here as a, as a peak, right, and it has a certain width. Right? So how can we reconcile this now with the, the fact that I, I just showed you a theory that contains delta functions? Um, and this is because we are not only exciting a single electron in this process, we are exciting many, many electrons, right? And then each one contributes a delta function and they're very closely spaced in energy, right? So a lot of delta functions closely spaced in energy can actually uh, give rise to, to a peak <clears throat> that has a finite width, right? Um, and this is then the peak that we are after. So it is a peak, right? So, the <clears throat> so it looks particle-like, right? So we call it a, a quasi-particle and then we can uh, attribute these three fundamental factors to it. The peak position we call the quasi-particle energy, then the width here we call the inverse of the lifetime, and then there's the peak weight under the curve, and that is the, the weight of the quasi-particle peak in the excited state spectrum, right? So this may sound a bit abstract, so let me motivate this quasi-particle from a different perspective. So here we were very much in, in energy space, right? So it makes sense. But let's look at this in real space. So we have our uh, sea of, of n electrons. We bring in the light. We kick out one electron, right? <clears throat> and then what, what stays behind is a hole, is a positive charge, right? And now we have positive charges and a whole bunch of negative charges. So what will the negative charges do? They will rush in right, because uh, well, they're attracted by the positive charge. So over time, if we let the system evolve, right, um, the electrons in the system will react to the introduction of this positive charge, and the, a, a C of negative charge, a sphere of negative charge will surround the positive one, it will screen out the positive charge, and then around this cloud, other electrons are repelled, right, so, and then over time, this, this system evolves, right? So the screening process is, is somewhat time dependent. It, it happens dynamically as you, as you would expect. But now here we have something like a, an entity, right? That we can then identify as this quasi-particle, right? So it is an elementary particle, a hole in this case, could be if we invert it, could be the electron. But in, this, in, a, in a, this electron or this hole in an environment is not a hole like a bare hole, a hole on its own. It carries system information around it, so it, uh, it is surrounded by, other, by electrons right, that, um, that screen it out. Right? And if we move the hole, these electrons will follow. Right? So uh, this combined entity will move through the, through the system. Right? <clears throat> so this is actually the quasi-particle that we're talking about, and this is the quasi-particle that is generated uh, in an experiment. It's an elementary particle that drags the um, system around with it. <clears throat> so then, if we wanted to build a theory for this, it would actually make sense, and this came up in, in Harald's talk uh, before the coffee break, um, to, to build a theory on not the bare Coulomb interaction, one over R minus R prime, but on the screen Coulomb interaction, right? So if we know the dielectric function, we can just simply convolute it with a bare Coulomb interaction to get the, the screen Coulomb interaction, right? And this then describes how this quasi-particle interacts with the rest of the system, right? Uh, namely via the screen Coulomb interaction. So now we're in a position to build a heuristic theory, right? Um, so the Green's function, it can also be interpreted as a propagator for the uh, quasi-particle, right? So it is a non-local quantity that depends on R and R prime. So we insert the quasi-particle at time, uh, um, so at time, yeah, uh, at position R, and then it moves to position R prime, and we can describe its motion with the Green's function, and then this motion, right, uh, during this motion, the quasi-particle interacts with the rest of the system via the screen Coulomb interaction now, right? So <clears throat> we close the loop with a, the W here, and this then gives us um, uh, a heuristic approximation for something called the, the self-energy. 
that we write as a product of G and, and W. Why is it called self energy? Well, it is an energy that is only there because the particle is there, right? You didn't see this thing in, in DFT, right? So it's an energy contribution that is induced by um, the presence of the particle itself, right? And it kind of measures the drag that it feels going through the system. <clears throat> now, why am I telling you all this? And do you believe me when I say this is um, what the self-energy should look like? Well, <clears throat> so that I motivated it from a sort of physical point of view, but it turns out that we were lucky because when you write down <clears throat> a full theory for this, this turns out to be an elementary uh, part of it. Now, what we need for the full theory is basically an entry point, right? So we need to start from something that we know, and that's a non-interacting Green's function that comes out of DFT. And then we know that the self-energy is the object that takes us from this non-interacting to the fully interacting Green's function that is called Dyson's equation. So with this last ingredient, we can then go to the full theory that is known as Hedin's equations. I know it looks horrible, and I hate showing equations like this, right? Because there's absolutely no way you can absorb all this in the minute that I'm showing this. Now, the reason I'm showing it to you is so that you believe me that a formal <laughs> framework exists. And if you go to this paper, you can look it up and you can look up the derivation, right? <clears throat> I will come to the point very quickly, but let me just briefly say what this is. So here's our friend the Green's function, and we can construct with it a polarizability that gives us the screen coulomb interaction that gives us the self energy, um, which is the object that we wanted, right? And then unfortunately, there's this nasty object here called the vertex function that links all this together and that also enters here. So this is all self consistent and interdependent on each other, right? But if you were to be able to solve this, this is like solving the full Schrodinger equation, you would get the exact answer. Now, Anytime you have something that is exact, it is also useless because it's often not tractable. It is always not tractable, right? But it is good, it is reassuring to know that such an exact framework exists because then you can make confident approximations, right? Or systematically improvable approximations. So what approximation will we make here, right? So I don't know if anybody has any idea if you can see it. Um, if you have a suggestion, please raise your hand. There's some people in the audience that know this. <clears throat> I give you a hint. So you make an approximation often out of desperation when you have an object that it is so horrible that you don't want to touch it. Right? And this object that is so horrible that you don't want to touch it is this one down here, right? because it contains this function. Not only is it the longest, but it also contains this functional derivative of the self-energy with respect to the Green's function. So let's try and get rid of this, right? Um, yeah, in order not to despair, um, by simply crossing it out. So if we take this object out, off it goes, right? Then we're left with something that is very easy, right? And that's a bunch of delta functions. I'm not the only one deleting parts. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> so delta functions we know how to handle. And in this particular case, they help us a great deal because if you insert wherever this gamma was before these delta functions, it means that the gamma simply disappears. And now this may still look complicated, but you can recognize here that the self energy is actually now in leading order just G times W, right? So this is a theory, right, that is based on this GW approximation in leading order. Right? But we also have a prescription, if we wish, to make it more complicated right? by finding better approximations that include part of the term that, that we threw away or neglected. Right? So here is actually now a paradigm change. So if you, I don't know if you had talks on quantum chemistry or if you're familiar with quantum chemistry, you try and do very much the same. You build up an exact framework where you add complexity by increasing the order of the Coulomb interaction that you include. Here we're doing the same, but we're working with a screen Coulomb interaction. This makes sense because we've taken some system information already into account. 
Okay, so how does it then work in practice once we've made this uh, approximation here? Um, so I said we needed an entry point, and that is our DFT calculation, right? We get our Cohn-Sham eigenvalues and our Cohn-Sham uh, wave functions. That is something you, you know all, all know how to calculate. And then we can go back to the definition of this Green's function, right? And then wherever we had these exact excitation energies and, and amplitudes, we can now plug in the Cohn-Sham equivalents. Right? We just simply put in the Cohn-Sham energies here and the Cohn-Sham wave functions, and then we can calculate this object. Don't worry about how it's done in the codes. Those formulas usually look a bit horrendous, but this has been done now since the 80s, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's proven to, to work. Once you have this object in a representation, then you can proceed um, down the line, basically. You can construct this polarizability, which is then simply a product of these two non-interacting Green's functions, right? So we just simply multiply these two G0s together that we now have. Now we have another object in our computer. This will help us greatly to calculate the dielectric function. So now from first principles, we can calculate the screening function of the material. This we can then invert. Some, somebody had this funny idea that the screen Coulomb interaction uses the inverse of the dielectric function, but that's just a matter of definition. Anyways, now we can calculate this object W, and now we have a G, we have a W, we get the, the self-energy G naught W naught. Again, with all the building blocks we have in place, we can calculate it, and then the final thing to do is extract the quasi-particle energies. <clears throat> this you can either do by solving this quasi-particle equation. It looks very much like the, the DFT Cohn-Sham equations, only now, after this non-interacting part, we have here the, the self-energy um, that sort of, if you wish, replaces VXC that we had in the Cohn-Sham equations. So if you, if you solve this equation in full, which is a bit tricky because the solution depends on the uh, solution. Um, so the wave function shows up both on the left and on the right, and here it's on the integral. Um, then you get new, quasi, you get new wave functions for your, for your excitations. Right? Um, the, if you don't want to do that, um, you can say we just do perturbation theory. So we, we postulate that our um, quasi-particle wave function is some kind of expansion in the non-interacting wave functions. If we just take the zeroth order, then that means that there's no change in the wave functions. And then this equation greatly simplifies, and we get um, this here. So then the quasi-particle energy is simply a correction to the Cohn-Sham energy. Right? So for every um, Cohn-Sham state, we get one quasi-particle state. And what we need to do is take out whatever exchange and correlation we had in the state and replace it by what comes from the self-energy. <clears throat> Good. Um, so if you work through the theory, then you uh, arrive at a formal scaling of the system size to the power of four. Right? So if you brute force implement this, then whenever you double the system size, you have a factor 16 increase of, of computer time. Um, so this is, this is not so good. So this is an expensive theory, right? But sometimes you just have to pay the price to do the right thing to get the right result, right? So I'm going to show you a few examples now where this is absolutely essential and, and you have to do that. And in the tutorial you do some more, but for smaller systems so you don't run into the scaling wall. Okay. <clears throat> so. As I said, one advantage of this is that we're working with the uh, screen Coulomb interaction, but we also have exact exchange in, in the theory. Right? So the self-energy here, if we just multiply the Green's function not with W, but with the Bear Coulomb interaction, you get exact exchange. And you've heard probably in numerous talks <coughs> throughout this, this school that exact exchange is something very important to have in theories these days. But it is not bare exchange because it's then complemented by, by the screening. Right? So W minus V is the screening due to the other electrons. So let me illustrate this point and, and the importance of this. So here's an example. It's silicon. Right? So on the left, you have the band structure of silicon in the local density approximation, uh, occupied and unoccupied states. It looks OK. Right? All the bands are there, and they have the right curvature. All of this is dictated by symmetry, so not a big surprise. The biggest surprise is actually when you look at the band, band gap here, which is the difference between the occupied and <coughs> unoccupied states, 
And uh, that should be 1.17 in experiment, but it is only 0.5 in LDA. So that's the infamous DFT band gap problem um, that you see in the Kornsham states. Now, I've taken this formula, our prescription for how to correct the Kornsham states, right? And I've split it up into these two parts, exchange and, and correlation. So let's only add the exchange part for now, right? Um, so this is sort of like a hearty fog calculation by the LDA wave functions. And look at the same thing. And now this looks bad, right? Uh, first of all, we've lost this band here. Well, it's still there, but it's a much lower energy. So we've completely we overstretched the spectrum, right? And the band gap is now, I don't know, six or seven electron volts. So ridiculous, right? It doesn't make any sense. And this is why nobody does hard to fork calculations for solids, right? <clears throat> now, if we then include this part that comes from the screening, right, uh, and do a proper GW calculation, you see everything is fine now. Our band has come back from the basement and we get a, a very good band cap now, right? So in this case, it's actually in very good agreement with experiment. So what this illustrates is that for solids or very highly polarizable materials, it is absolutely essential that we work with a theory that contains the screen Coulomb interaction, that we work with a, a screen Coulomb interaction, right? in the screen's function framework. <clears throat> okay, so here's another example uh, of work that, that we did a few years ago. So remember these blue lines that I showed you, these spectra, so these were ARPIS experiments for zinc oxide. Um, and if you sort of look at the spectrum from the top and then color code the, the heights, basically, then you see, then you get this picture here. So high intensity is, is white and black, I think. <clears throat> no, it's white, um, and, and blue is sort of background, then you, you get something that looks like a band structure, right? So in what I sort of, to aid your interpretation, I've superimposed the band structure that I've calculated with the GW method, and then you see that we get a very good match, right? So we are correct in the, the positions of these bands as well as the, the curvatures, meaning the, the effective masses, right? So <clears throat> this is, is good testimony for uh, getting the, the right quantity out for the right reason. Now these are only occupied states. Remember, photo emission only gives us access to the occupied states. We don't have information on, on the band gap. Um, so band gap is actually something that this theory, GW theory, was known for, and it's, that's very much its claim to fame, that it was very good at calculating band gaps. Now you can measure band gaps differently. Most of the time you get it from optical absorption and you know the exciton binding energy or when the exciton binding energy is small. Um, so we do have good reference values for band gaps of some materials. So here are some. And what I'm showing you here are then uh, computed band gaps versus experimental band gaps. So if you had a perfect theory, this would then fall on the diagonal. Um, and you can see if we just take the LDA eigenvalue differences, then we're way off, actually, and the error is not even very systematic, right? And if we then switch, actually, to a different DFT functional, this exact exchange, we're doing a little bit better, actually quite a bit better. But then, really, the, the big improvement comes from GW. So if we put GW on top, do a proper calculation, we're actually very close to the diagonal here. Um, so we actually have a a high accuracy method for, for band caps. Okay, so this brings me then back to the, this question mark, right? Um, <clears throat> so if there was a question mark on the band cap of a material, can we then use this theory that we've just proven is very good for band caps to help, this, help solve this problem? So let me illustrate this problem a little bit better. Um, so here's a chart uh, like a collection of all the experimentally measured band gaps for this material in the year 2005. 2005 wasn't that long ago, right? So they measured anything from maybe 0.6 to, I think the highest value here is 2.2. And actually, historically, this information isn't in here. Historically, the, the older values were all up here, right? So they were above 2. So for, as I said, for the longest time, people believed the value for but this band gap was, was around two. And then these experiments became available and then everybody started to question uh, this old value and, and wondered what was going on. 
what was worse actually was when only these values were available, a lot of theoreticians that were running calculations for band gaps of this material tried to make their calculations give two electron volts. And they couldn't. They always got a lower value. And they were fudging all sorts of things. Right? And in the end, it turned out everything they fudged was completely wrong because they should have aimed for this and not for that value. Right? So always be careful when you do that. <clears throat> so some clue as to what's going on is given here by this x-axis. That's the carrier concentration of the material. So more about this in a minute. So many reasons were put forward for why this band gap uh, might be different. So the high carrier concentration gives rise to the Moss-Bernstein effect, which gives you an, uh, an effective gap that might look larger. Then impurities, point defects, or trapping centers could be what you're actually measuring instead of the real band gap. Um, Non-stoichiometry <coughs> could be a problem if your growth isn't perfected, then you don't actually have indium nitride. You have a very different material, although you might not know it. Um, if you have oxygen in the chamber, you could actually form an oxynitride, uh, which then could have very different properties. What was also speculated was that uh, metal precipitates, and then you get uh, some indium clusters in, in an indium nitride matrix, and you're picking up a signal from those, like maybe a plasmon resonance or something like that. And then every explanation had a theory that backed it up. Um, <clears throat> so what we thought was, okay, we have density functional theory, so in the computer we can prepare absolutely pure indium nitride without all these defects, without the oxynitride, right? So really pure hexagonal indium nitride. And then if we pair it up with GW with a theory that gives us predictive power on the band gap, then we can maybe make an authoritative statement that if you had an absolutely pure material, that is the band gap you should get. Right? <clears throat> so this is then what we did, and here in red, is the band structure. And you see the fundamental band gap in this GW calculation is 0.7 electron volts. So it is actually low. Right? It is not two electron volts. So that was our statement. The band gap should be low. And then we went on to explain why such a variety of, of results was observed. <clears throat> this you can understand when you then picture what would happen if you had excess electrons. Say, in your growth, we introduce impurities and they donate electrons. And then you have an intrinsically doped sample. They knew it was n type doped. They knew they had too many electrons. So where do they go? They go to the bottom of the conduction band. So you have a pool of electrons here in this uh, uh, well, <clears throat> in this bowl. And then here, you can work out basically up to which energy this band is filled, given the, the curvature of the band and the electron concentration. You can see you start filling it up very quickly as a function of carrier concentration. Now, the way the band gaps were measured was by optical absorption, right? <clears throat> so you make an excitation here at the gamma point, uh, and that's how you would determine what the band gap is. But you cannot make this excitation if electrons are sitting there. That state is just simply not available. What you then have to do, or what the photon has to do, is have to find another electron that can make a direct transition further out. Like maybe if you attend to the 18, you have to go beyond this to the left, right? So you do your transition out here, um, but then you need much more energy, right? Because the band curves away from you. It curves away from the valence band, and the valence band curves away, right? So you're, you're measuring uh, a band gap. You're measuring a value that is, is larger than the band gap, so you, you seemingly have a larger <coughs> band gap, right? Because you don't know uh, necessarily, you, you just can't measure down here, right? So what we can then do with these results is we can plot now the <clears throat> band gap as a function of carrier concentration using these results. Uh, and this is what you get in red here. This is our prediction for how the band gap should behave as a function of carrier concentration. And it falls right through um, these points. So now it is actually accepted that this was the problem. And if you find a growth method that reduces the carrier concentration, which they did here in these samples, and now they can go even lower, then you indeed find a fundamental intrinsic band gap that is of the order of 0.7, which proves the point. And luckily, this is what makes solid state lighting, lighting possible and saves us a lot of energy. OK, <clears throat> so let me come to the organic electronics. Uh, I'll only touch on a, on a small part of it. And there's more in the talk, but I probably won't have time for it. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> and this is related to, to interfaces, right? So they always, we, we call it organic electronics, but there's always an interface, right, to mostly a crystal or a metal or, or something like that. We need a contact to get charge in and out, right? It can be very thin, but it's always there. And now the community has realized that oftentimes it is actually this interface or the properties at that interface that really determine your device performance. It's not so much the organic itself. Sometimes it's the organic itself too, but the interface actually uh, can play a very large role. So then naturally you want to understand what it does to then optimize it and, and um, like tailor it. Um, so let me draw your attention to one particular um, effect at such an interface that, that plays a large role. Um, so here's a rendition of, of an interface as we would uh, picture it in, in atomistic first principles theory. So it looks very clean. So here we have a, a semiconductor molecule on top of it. In DFT, you would mostly be interested in uh, the molecular geometry the adsorption site, for instance, what, what's the shape of this molecule, how strongly does it bind, so on and so forth. But, and, and this is then also related uh, to the electronic properties of this interface, and by that I mean um, what is the alignment of electronic states relative to each other. So let me show you the same interface that we see here in real space than in, in energy space. <clears throat> um, so if we have a semiconductor, that we put electrons on. This will have a band cap and a Fermi level somewhere. And then the molecules or the organic gives us uh, sta molecular states. They can broaden into molecular bands due to disorder or due to interaction, hybridization. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, what matters more is the distance of these states to the, to the Fermi level, right? If you now think of transport across this interface, you want to get charged, say, from here to there. And then if you do this with an electron, then it sees the step here, so it sees a barrier, the electron injection barrier this, that it has to overcome in order to, to get across. Now, if you write down a very simple expression for this uh, current, then you see that this barrier shows up in the exponent, so therefore the current depends exponentially on this, this barrier height, which if you want to block transport is great. If you have a very high barrier, if you want to facilitate transport, then you want a very low barrier, right? So actually the distance here between these matters the most, and that's why it's called energy level alignment. You want to align the levels on the left and on the right such that they're optimal for your purpose, right? <clears throat> um, so before you can do that, you actually need to know what they are, right? And this is where uh, GW comes in helpful again. Um, so there's a, a tricky effect that uh, gets in the way. So if we um, look at this cartoon first, so imagine the molecule is, is far away in the gas phase, right? So say we can calculate the, the molecular levels in the gas phase, then, <clears throat> um, then, then we, we send in light. And this gives us the, the ionization potential that we kick out an electron, we're left with a hole. So this is a charged particle in front of a surface. Right, so say this is a metal surface. Now immediately alarm bell should be going off and you should say electrostatics 101, this is the image effect. And it is true. So what this charged, uh, charge in front of the surface does, it induces a polarization charge in the surface. So a negative um, charge response here. Electrons will rush to the surface, very much as we saw in the previous cartoon, and they will actually give rise to a potential, right? the so-called image potential, for holes, it looks like this. For electrons, it looks like that. And if we now complete our Gedanken experiment and move the molecule closer and closer to the surface, right, from right to left, then the electronic states will write this potential and they will change. So if we then brought the molecule all the way to the surface, we may have induced a little bit of hybridization. That's why I broadened this. Um, but now the energy levels of the molecule uh, have a different value than they have in the gas phase, so they got renormalized by this extra interaction that is there between the, the molecule and the surface. <clears throat> so if you wanted to include it, um, you know for a metal surface you can work this out <clears throat> um, electrostatically, and this potential has to shape 1 over 4z, z being the distance to the surface. And if you work this out for a semiconductor or insulator, you see <clears throat> that you retain the basic shape, 
but you have to put in this dielectric prefactor here. So again, any theory that can capture this <clears throat> has to be a theory of the dielectric function. <clears throat> so now we're in a good position because we have a theory <clears throat> of the dielectric function. So we work with the screen Coulomb interaction in W. So we should actually have uh, a theory with GW that can capture this effect. So let me demonstrate to you that this is indeed the case. Um, so the example that we picked was CO on sodium chloride. <clears throat> if you do a DFT calculation for um, CO in the gas phase, you heavily underestimate the experimental value. And if you then do a GW calculation, you, you fix this. So this is good. <clears throat> what um, happens when you put CO on sodium chloride and you do a DFT calculation for that is the gap actually goes up. It doesn't go down. <clears throat> the image effect tells you the gap should go down. So this has to do with uh, some rearrangement of atoms here, and some electrostatic interaction. Now, if you apply the GW theory, you see you get from 15.1 down to 13.1. So this is actually a reduction of two electron volts. It goes in the right direction, and it's a big energy shift. Right? So imagine this, so sodium chloride has a very small dielectric constant. If you now have a semiconductor with, say, 12, or a metal with a very high dielectric constant, this reduction will be several electron volts larger, can be up to six or eight electron volts. So this is a very large effect right, that you're missing if you don't include this. And this is actually a problem why almost no DFT, I'll say this outright, no DFT calculation for this level alignment is correct, full stop, if you don't include this effect. Right. And there are now ways of including it because GW calculations for interfaces are still too expensive <clears throat> by putting these potentials in the calculation. Let me prove to you that this really was the image effect. And for that, uh, we, we did a calculation where we repeated this Gedanken experiment. So we put sodium chloride uh, on germanium to create a, another interface. Germanium has a higher dielectric constant, gives us a stronger image effect. And then put the CO on top of that. And then in the sandwich structure, we increased the thickness of the sodium chloride layers <clears throat> from 2 to 3 to 4 to 6, whatever. And then what you see is the sodium chloride, uh, the CO moves further and further away from the germanium, so it rides the image tail up right, in, in energy. Right? So what you would expect now is that the CO gap in this compound system becomes dependent on the thickness of the sodium chloride layer. And this is indeed the case. Right? If you look at the GW results, we have uh, the smallest gap for the thinnest layer, so when the CO is closest to the germanium, and then as we move it further away from the germanium, the gap of CO increases until eventually we'll recover the 13.1 for just pure sodium chloride. Right? So this proves that this renormalization is there and that it really is the image effect. Again, if you had done this just in DFT, then um, you would have missed it completely. There's, there's no dependence on this, or if there's a slight dependence, it goes in the wrong direction. Okay, so briefly, let me say a few words about what is wrong with DFT. Um, <clears throat> so in exact DFT, uh, at least for finite systems, we have a, um, a theorem that says that the highest occupied Kuhn-Sham state is, is equal to the ionization potential. This you can prove um, by um, potential, by considering the asymptotic form of the potential. Um, but this is the only thing we have. For, for no other state can we prove such an exact relation. Right? The only thing that you can do is invoke Janak's theorem that tells you that the difference or the change in total energy is related to the eigenvalue. You can integrate this and then you arrive at your total energy difference for the excited state that already came out of the sort of former theory. So this you can then use by uh, setting this S here to the ground state, right? And then you can extract three quantities exactly if you want. So the, if you work with the N minus one electron state, you get the ionization potential exactly from this total energy difference. If you add an electron, you get the electron affinity exactly, um, or the difference of those gives you the gap of the system, right? So these are just total energy arguments. You know, DFT in principle gives you the exact total energy, so therefore this, this must work, right? 
Um, here's an example that there's a big difference between eigenvalues and, and total energies. This is all related to the self-interaction error that you've heard about last week. So here for atoms, this is illustrated if you look at the total energy difference for at ionization potential of atoms, they agree much better with reference values, this is an LDA I think, than the LDA eigenvalue, right? So in principle, um, this, this is an okay way to proceed using total energy differences. There is a problem though, um, <clears throat> because I said this is only justified for differences of ground states. So if we wanted access to any other state, we couldn't really do that, right? So then you would have to implement constraints that constrain your um, electron in, in a given state that isn't the ground state, and this constraint uh, is not clearly defined, and, and it uh, <clears throat> might affect your uh, energy adversely. And then what is worse is that you know, excited state densities are not unique. Um, right, this is this one here. And then it's actually also kind of tedious to do a separate calculation for every, every state. Imagine a band structure where you have thousands of points. That means thousands of calculations. Okay, they're cheap. <clears throat> um, another point that is related to this delocalization error is coming back to this difference between the cone sham eigenvalue and the cone sham uh, sorry, the total energy difference. So here, I don't know, this is from uh, a system that also Thomas Kurtzdorfer showed, uh, a, a polymer. <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is again, the ionization potential calculated as a total energy difference. Now as a function of the length of this polymer. Right? So initially, this delta SCF approach uh, gives us very good ionization potentials and then they decrease down and eventually you get the same as, as you do from a cone sham difference. So if the ele electronic state becomes infinitely delocalized, then um, this, this uh, delta SCF approach breaks down and you get the same as from the, the eigenvalues. Um, and in fact, the real answer should be up here. And this uh, is again related to the delocalization or self-interaction error that you heard about last week. <clears throat> so the last thing I wanted to do, and then I'm done, is to briefly talk about the, the band gap problem. So having realized this here, that for infinite excited states, uh, for infinitely delocalized states, as you would find in a solid, uh, we have a problem. Then if we wanted to calculate the gap of a solid as a function, uh, yeah, uh, as a difference of total energies, then uh, we would have a problem. So in principle, you could, you could write it this way but then it is actually hard to calculate these uh, total energies for the solid, right? So there are problems related to the homogeneous background you have to introduce when you add an electron and there are problems with this delocalization error. So although it looks nice on paper, it doesn't actually work. So you have to rely on the cone sham eigenvalues and there's a problem with those also. And this is then my last slide. So in principle, what you should do is calculate, uh, start from the cone sham eigenvalue of the neutral system, and uh, the highest one of that, and then add the, again, the highest one of the n plus one electron system, right? So in principle, these are actually exact, so that should work. But that's not what you do in practice. What you do in practice is you stay with the neutral system, right? And then you take the highest eigenvalue, highest occupied eigenvalue, and then you go to the next one. So this would be the LUMO or the bottom of the conduction band. Right, so this is what we do in practice. This is the cone sham gap. So I got to this by adding and subtracting uh, this term in the middle. So this is what we started off with. And I added zero to it. So actually what you realize is there is another contribution here that corresponds to cone sham eigenvalues uh, of the same uh, number but for, in this case, a charged system, and in that case, a neutral system. So that same state, actually, um, but in a charged and a neutral system. So this is what's missing, right, if you just look at the cone sham gap. So let's analyze this term very briefly, and then I conclude. <clears throat> um, so as we add an electron uh, to a solid, the, the density won't change very much, right? So we have 10 to the 23 electrons, we add one more, not much is gonna change. Um, so that means the Hartree energy is not gonna change much um, and the external potential is not gonna change. So the only thing that then can make a difference is the, the exchange correlation potential. 
right? And it turns out that um, this will change discontinu discontinuously as you add this one electron. As you add an infinitesimal amount of charge to the system, you get a jump, right? And whenever you have such discontinuities, it's very hard to include them properly in the theories. So it turns out that if you wanted to use the Cohn-Sham gaps to make a prediction for the band gap, you need to add this term. And to estimate this term, you need a self-energy again. So it's a catch-22. But this is missing from most, uh, at least local or semi-local, DFT functionals. And this then explains why uh, we are way down here with the Cohn-Sham eigenvalues when we should actually be up here. So a large part of this difference between the blue, circle, blue squares uh, and, and the straight line is due to this derivative discontinuity. Okay, so this brings me to the, the end of my lecture. Um, so I've introduced to you the basic principles of electron spectroscopy and introduced Green's function of self-energy to you. Then I've shown you the GW approximation to the self-energy and given you a few cases where uh, this really gives us access to the, to the physics we're really, really interested in. And then I've talked a little bit, although very quickly, about the pros and cons of, of DFT for excitation energies. Okay, thank you for your attention.